In October 2011, Apple introduced the first virtual assistant to hit the market. Now, Siri was the very last project for Steve Jobs, and other companies moved in quickly. Now, soon after that, Amazon created their own assistant named Alexa after the famous library in Egypt, which is the most popular voice assistant today. Now, then in 2020, Google showed a demo for a new assistant called Duplex, which made a famous hair appointment during their Google I.O. conference. And you got to hear that moment. So how can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. The two weeks ago, the Bing app was released with a voice assistant that can use ChatGPT. And honestly, it made Google look a little bit sluggish. Now, why did Google release Duplex earlier? I often wonder that when it had a lot of the technology that could crush ChatGPT before it got started. Now, I'm thinking at least one of the reasons was Duplex was a little bit creepy. I mean, what if you can no longer trust that what you read see or hear is coming from a computer. Maybe the world wasn't ready for that. So here we are today, and ready or not, we're about to find out what Google didn't want us to have. Now, I think it'll definitely have some serious consequences. Hey there, I'm your host, Ray Villalobos, and I'm a software engineer at LinkedIn Learning and senior staff instructor. And today I'm talking to Diana Kelly. She was the global executive security advisor at IBM Security cybersecurity field CTO at Microsoft, and she's currently the chief security officer at Cybrise. Now, Diana, can you share a little bit about your journey into cybersecurity and your experience with AIs all the way from IBM's Watson to your thoughts about the newer models like Alexa and ChatGPT? Okay, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's, a lot of people know that I've been interested and sort of obsessed with computers since the 1970s. And interestingly, my, that was actually my first experience with AI it was also back in the 1970s. And I don't know if it was like my old Heathkit or TRS-80 Model 1, but in any case, there was a program called ELISA. And ELISA was written... Back in the 1960s, believe it or not, I think 1964 was when it was written by someone at MIT named Joseph Weizenbaum. And ELISA was a natural language system. So you, mm -hmm. it, it spoke with you in natural language. You, you responded to, you put inputs in, obviously, by a keyboard. I don't think that there was voice recognition at that point. Maybe, maybe there was, but I know I used it with the keyboard. And it was named after Eliza Doolittle because the intent was that as Eliza continued speaking with others, it, Eliza would learn and acquire language improvements programmatically that would be put into Eliza's scripts. And there, well, Eliza had one script called Doctor, which was the one that I used. And Eliza was essentially emulating a therapist. There was a lot of, how does that make you feel? You say you said this, how does it feel this way? If you used it, it was pretty cool. I liked it a lot. Uh, but it got a little boring after a while because you got the sense that you were just getting the same stuff back from the system again and again. So I sort of moved on from it. But when I was thinking about when you asked, you know, I, I knew I was coming on here, I was thinking about you know, what, what happened with Eliza at the time, because it did feel kind of human interacting with Eliza. And apparently back in the 1960s, when Eliza was first brought out, people were using it. Uh, you know, I think like, you know, people at MIT, there was a concern that it was human, that it was you know, actually speaking. There was people who were worried that it was going to start doing things that maybe it shouldn't. You know, we might get to like your singularity. Uh, so I was really surprised that that, you know, 60 years ago, 
that this was actually, you know, what we're talking and worried about with AI. We've had this for a very long time. Now, the big difference between Eliza and something like ChatGPT or what you just showed um, with Google is that, it, you know, just the sophistication, the use cases, the, the advances in generative AI, so using machine learning to provide answers based on statistical probability using massive amounts of data or a corpus of knowledge that the, the system has been trained on. So all of these things, Eliza was very, very rudimentary compared to what we're looking at now. But it is kind of interesting that this is something that this, this, the, the ideas of this technology have been around for a long time. Um, yeah, I remember so, yeah. Eliza, and it was very interesting. It's a very fantastic project. And I do, I've been around long enough to know that at the time, everything that you said, I really found it interesting and, like you said, boring because it was kind of just sort of like repeating the questions. And you got the feeling that this is how a psychologist talks to you, like they don't really want to say anything or have opinions. And so, but it was just fascinating that it could. And, and if you look at that technology and how it did those things, uh, it was based on a lot of research, though, so, like you said, in the same way that we see these things reappear today in a different sense. And we yeah. see the same questions that we got back then today. I know that you had a lot of experience with what's maybe, and I'm not sure if this is correct, the very first sort of voice assistant, Watson, way before Siri, you know, way before Alexa, and you have some experience. And then what sort of things did you see with something like Watson that maybe are repeating themselves today? Yeah, so so Watson for anybody that that doesn't doesn't know Watson is what famously won Jeopardy back in in 2011, and Watson was a computer developed at, at well system developed at at IBM. Um, and you know, something that a lot of people may not know is that, and it, it, if you're a human listening to this, you may feel a little bit proud of this. But one of the big differentiators between Watson and the humans was actually reaction time. So the humans would have to, you know, the way Jeopardy's played is that you read the question and the human is starting to think as the question is being read. But with Watson, you needed to wait for Watson to have the entire question there. And then after Watson was ready to say it was, it could, it could buzz in or not. And the humans got a light and looking at the light said, you can buzz in if you know it. And the human, just human reaction time to recognize the light being on takes, you know, tenths of a second for a human and to put our hand down to buzz or the finger. And it's only about eight milliseconds for Watson to buzz. So there's wow. some discussion that Watson, it may have been that the humans might have been able to beat Watson if it weren't for that lag in, mm. in time, uh, which is, but, but still, let's not downplay the fact that Watson did an amazing feat. It ingested huge and huge amounts of data and was able to infer from those Jeopardy questions with the most statistically probable answer. And when it had a confidence rate, it would, it would respond with that. So that was you know, a massive, it was a, an absolute massive feat. But what's changed since Watson? Um, how much more data do we have? And if you think mm. about it, like you know, they talk about digital, you know, data being the new oil, and that there's more data created and then that'll be created in the next month and in the first like ten years of the internet, and, or I think the next couple of days. I mean, it's like I I don't know this exact numbers, but but lots of data. I think we can all mm -hmm. agree on, on lots and lots about uh, lots of data to train the systems, and with AI and ML that training data really helps it quite a bit, whether you're using supervised machine learning that's labeled, or if you're using unsupervised, that's unlabeled, where you're looking for patterns. To human beings, the more data that you have, that can, it can be harder to find the pattern, but to mm. a computer system, the more data it has, the more patterns it can find. So data to reason over to learn from and that we can feed into these systems is we just have to have so much more. Think about what did IBM buy a few years ago, right around the Watson time? IBM bought weather.com. Hmm. And Interesting. what does weather.com have? Huge amounts of weather data and da <laughs> weather data is particularly uh, well, you know, it, it, it fits well into a predictive model because if you keep looking at patterns over time and over years and over decades, you might be able to start to get a much better feel for what the average temperature is going to be in an area in any given month or every any given quarter. So 
that, that, that amount of data that really, really matters. And that's, there's just more data um, to, that's available. And it's particularly useful, as I said, you know, in like these supervised uh, applications, you know, where you're looking for things like classification, is this, is uh, looking at a radiograph, for example, is this cancer or not? Or looking at a phishing mm. email, is this phishing or not? Um, another mm. big one is what's going on with generative AI. And that's where we're all we're all seeing that whether you're an artist who's seeing generative AI emulate your art and feeling a little bit like, is this a copyright infringement? Are you taking my art from me? Or you're seeing the generative AI like ChatGPT, where you ask it to write a poem or create a, a recipe and it's generating that information. So the advances in generative AI and especially the generative, the GANs, the generative adversarial networks that started around 2014 have really pushed forward the momentum in the generative side of AI. But wow. I, th I think something that, that is important to remember too, though, is that sometimes we can get really ahead of ourselves when we have these leaps. We start to feel really excited about how fast things are going. But things, a lot of things aren't always as, as simple. You know, we can get pretty far. And I bet you know this, right? Because you're a developer. You know that that you, you have a plan for an app or for a new service. And and at first, like, things move really quickly. Mm -hmm, and then it, it, yeah. it kind of, like, then the progress can really slow down sort of towards the end. Uh, that, I, I think we should take that into account with AI and how we use it. I mean, a great example is back in 2017 or 2016, the head of Tesla said that fully self-driving cars was going to be a reality in 2017. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have a fully self-driving car. <laughs> Still waiting for my flying car. Yeah. And uh, Mr. Fusion and, you know, all those things that we, yeah, you're totally right. I, I know that in, in computers, we always say that, um, you know, the, what do they say that, you know, 80% of the work gets done, you know, with 20% of the resources or like that, you get to 80% of the final product. And it's that last 20% that is really, really hard to get to. I think maybe, you know, part of the reason we, we're we seeing things like ChatGPT have trouble answering questions is that it's not as refined as it should be. Although, you know, we're seeing it be useful and in, in terms of generative AI, where we get like artwork, you know, that it creates that is amazing uh, with yeah. some prompts, it's it's already useful enough that it's causing people to think about it more. But I do think we need to yeah. remember that this has been around for a long time. And, you know, people like you who have that deep background with all the AIs understand you've seen this, you know, you've seen this movie before. So don't don't get too excited about it. So um, every week I do this poll where I see how people feel about the topic that we're talking about. And this week I asked a question, what cybersecurity risks are you most concerned about when using artificial intelligence? And some of the possible questions is bias in the AI, inability to trust answers. And you can see that I, you know, the little check mark means so that's what I put. So I don't know, I'm sometimes upset that it, it always shows my answer. So insufficient usage oh. guidelines <laughs> and liability for errors. So just wondering, what do you think about these results? And was anything surprising or any thoughts about this? So one of the things where you put that up, and, and I voted too, um, is that uh, I, one of the comments, which I, I really vibed with, was said that, you know, that they're all important. <laughs> like all of that's these right, that's concerns. Right. I'm concerned about all of them. And I was like, yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, they're all they're all things that we, I think we need to we need to look at and consider in the ethical use of AI as we roll it out and depend on it more and more. But I too, uh, those top two answers are also the two that I would put as the ones that are the most concerning for me. Bias specifically because if we, you know, bias in AI is automated and can become deeply ingrained and systemic. So if we're not careful about addressing bias in AI, we're just going to automate this. And there are some really infamous examples of the, the AI ATS uh, applicant tracking system that started to, to drift towards bias, which by the way, most models will drift toward bias. So it's not just that we have to be careful with what we train the models on and, and, and how we tune the models, but also they're going to drift toward bias. And this one drifted toward the bias of uh, selecting candidates that were named Jared and it's like lacrosse as being like this, this AI's favorite job seeker hmm. candidates, which, 
unless you're hiring Jareds to play lacrosse, that's sort of an interesting set of <laughs> criteria, right? You know, so that so when we talk about bias, it's I think sometimes people like you know not understand that that's it's it's really that it's going to drift toward bias and it could drift toward bias in an unusual way. And then there's the very obvious bias where in facial recognition, researchers have showed fantastic proofing of that these systems, they, they are better most of the time with certain skin colors. And very often it's a lighter skin color. So they do fairly good confidence on lighter skin colors of males. So pale males tend to be where these mm -hmm. systems are the best. And then it goes down from there. Um, you know, and that, that kind of bias, if we're going to use facial recognition for any meaningful use, we have to make sure that it's completely inclusive. And then the inability to trust dancers, Th this one, and, I, and I, I say this a lot, but it, I think it's really, if we all stop and take a beat, if I gave you two 10 digit numbers right now, Ray, and asked you to multiply them, uh, would you do that in your head or on a piece of paper, or would you use a, a calculator? Uh, I think today I would just pull up ChatGPT really quick, or I would probably hit Command Space on my Mac, and it would give me that search bar right there. That's how I do most of my math. And uh, possibly a real nerd would do like uh, Jupyter Notebooks <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> oh, I love it. OK, so what, once you've asked whatever system you want to tell you what those two 10-digit numbers multiplied is, would you then go and check it yourself by I'm just going to I'll just get out my pen and paper and just double check the system. Probably never. Yeah, <laughs> it has right? that I mean, it was I, correct. I know I, I wouldn't. Um, that's why, you know, I have a calculator. Um, but think about that with with we do tend to believe what when a computer we ask it a tough question that we don't know if it gives us an answer, especially if it gives it to us confidently, then why would we question it? And I. Yes. I, I asked ChatGPT three different times what books, and I, it was very specific because someone pointed out Diana Kelly's not the, the most uncommon name. It's, it's true. There's a, a, a realtor with this name. Um, there's a, a singer, country singer, Diana Kelly. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I didn't want to make it hard for ChatGPT. I said, what security or cybersecurity books has Diana Kelly written? And mm -hmm. I asked ChatGPT three different times, and ChatGPT failed ever once to say either of the books that I've, I've co-written or the books that I've contributed chapters to. It came up mm. with books that I was not associated with at all, and then kind of enriched those answers with a very confident explanation of what I had done in writing those books and why they were good and why I had explained <laughs> wow. them. And, and yeah. That is so Which, scary because, you, you know, they. I'm sorry, like psychologists talk about how memory is very fuzzy. So I know that sometimes, you know, I, I say that it's like when my dad tells me confidently, uh, you know, a bad sort of answer, because to me, he's an authority figure. I always feel like maybe it's not him. Maybe I'm the one who's wrong. And, you know, in the pre-show, you mentioned some examples to that, that we think of computers as being infallible. Like we would never question given it a math problem, like if I type it in Jupyter Notebooks or, you know, just in my calculator, like I would never go, well, I got better, you know, triple check that with like three different sources like you do in journalism, you know. So, yeah, that's a it's a new era, I think, for uh, getting to answers that we have to at least right now. Do you, do you feel like maybe eventually that'll go away? Are we ever going to truly be able to trust them? I mean, I think it's going to be for what use cases and how well those systems have been been trained, because mm -hmm. there's there's also another thing that was in the news a lot this week was around the the use of ML to classify radiograph pictures to be able to detect cancer earlier than a human, the human eye could necessarily mm -hmm. detect cancer um, in that, which is that that's good. I mean, I think. But right now we still need doctors to human doctors to also look at that. I don't think there are any machine doctors yet, uh, but human doctors, <laughs> humans to look and, and check over what that was. So it can assist the humans, but I think at this point, not necessarily replace because there are things. So for example, in a radiograph and in, in image classification, there's, there's something called noise or perturbation that occurs mm. in, in images. And there was this really super famous example of an image of a panda 
in a, an ML image classification system, which is what if you're reading cancer as lesions, or you're reading radiographs to look for cancer, you're, you're doing in a form of image classification. Um, so in this one, the ML system, it was like around a 60% uh, confidence level that this picture of a panda, which right, you and I would immediately go, that's a panda. Um, it was about 60% confidence level that mm -hmm. it was a panda. And then a little bit of noise perturbation was introduced to this image. To a human being, it looked exactly like a panda. I've looked at the, the image with the perturbation in it multiple times. And, you know, I've, I've really honed in. I can't, it, it's not visible to me at least. But interestingly, the ML now classified that same image with a 99% certainty rate, which so it's now mm -hmm. really confident or confidence rate. It's really confident that it knows what it is, but it said it was a gibbon, hmm. not a panda. That's, yeah, and it looks yes. still... And, right. you know, I, and I really enjoyed that about the, the course that you did for us, because this is the part where I was like clinging to my popcorn and getting a little nervous, turn the nightlight on because I was watching your course and you talk about this perturbation and other issues that can be like in injected into like the AIs that get super scary. Uh, before we get too far, I want to I want to just let people know that as usual, you can ask questions in the chat. And I'll be getting to those at a certain point in the show specifically, but I'll also add them if I see some questions relevant to what we're talking about. So I definitely want to bring up um, Alyssa's uh, sort of more of a note here. Be sure to check out oh. your amazing course. And again, there's some fantastic uh, stuff in the course. I would probably advise that you watch it in the daylight, you know, when you're super confident. Because uh, <laughs> I'm really, I'm just, I'm just joking, but it's a really good course and you get into just all the possible ways that that things can be attacked and and you know how do we mitigate those things i really enjoyed the course and i'm not a cybersecurity sort of aficionado but it was really a great course I, i'd like to shout out and i shout this out in the, the talk to uh ram shankar who is the data mm -hmm. cowboy at, at at microsoft he created a framework with some folks at harvard around failure modes of machine learning and ai which i used as a, a foundational lifting point for that course so his work is also you know and i i reference it there's great references to where ron's work is but mm -hmm. yeah i strongly recommend everybody if you if, read the course and then there's a lot of links and and deeper learning to go into because this is a it's a deep topic Yes, definitely. We have another question really quick before we get into the rest of the, the normal interview. So basically, what are your thoughts on the description of generative tools as quote unquote knowing things? There was a huge article of, I think it's a Google engineer who believed that the AI had become human. You know, um, these aren't search engines. And uh, let's see, that was a quite a long question there. Let me pull it back up. They're not decide, designed for accuracy, but relevancy. Their wonderful ideation, but maybe their presentation have overstated their ability. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I love that. The, what uh, David, I, I love what you said, and and Ray, it's interesting because you and I were kind of having a little similar discussion right before we we spoke, which is that um, yeah, because at this point they're they're not a hundred percent accurate. They, ChatGPT still doesn't know what books I've actually written, which is mm -hmm. easy. That's an easy for us. We're like, but that's a pattern match, you know, that seems really easy. But these systems are, it's, it's about being trained on the corpus of knowledge and then looking for patterns and statistical probability. So the books that the ChatGPT ascribed to me were statistically probable for me to have written because it mm. did know who I was. It, it had background on what I had worked on. So there, it had been trained on that. So it was statistically probable that I would write a book on zero trust. I just haven't written a book I see. on zero, so zero trust. It might, it might be something akin to like the Google autocomplete, like it's trying to figure out what, I don't know, what pattern would appear next in the answers. And maybe that's a little bit of where it gets into trouble that it also it wants to very quickly. And I might say authoritatively, like tell you an answer, <laughs> but it could be wrong. And, you know, I mean, it's like when you have a friend that maybe isn't, uh, I don't know, the most like trustworthy person, you, you know, right now everybody's excited, but you may get to a point where you're like, well, I don't know if I can use any of this data. It's not like, you know, people, uh, you know, got um, upset with like Wikipedia because you couldn't really necessarily sometimes trust things, but we're, we're into another level where the computer is giving you a lot of data and you can't just use it right now. So uh, let's get you into to, uh, some of the other. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Check it. 
And I did want to, to, to comment on David's point about ideation. I completely mm -hmm. agree with that too, that, you know, if you're brainstorming and you, you're alone, ChatGPT is a fantastic uh, friend. I, I know it's a system, but it's a fantastic system to do that brainstorming with because that sort of type ahead can actually mm -hmm. come up with at least trigger things in your brain or even maybe sometimes find the, the new idea that, that really is the right fit that was sort of just. Yeah. And, and I mentioned that I, I really love to use it for times where I'm stuck on ideation or if I need to brainstorm. Yeah. It's really great. You can say, give yeah. me 100 answers and it will give you a statistically, I guess, semi-accurate answers, not, you know, for like maybe a poll or if you are writing something and you need some ideas, sometimes like you get writer's block and you can't think yeah. very well about some things. So it's really fantastic for that. Or if you like ask it to summarize things, it's really good at summarizing content. Uh, yeah. And it's really good at considering context in a way. I know like the the, the coding tools yeah. are kind of like this. The copilot from from uh, GitHub, you know, considers the context of what you've written based on what you have before and now after the code that you have on the page. So that's pretty good. So let's get into some of yeah. the other questions. So part of your job at IBM was advising these top level executives to develop security strategies. So what was the advice you gave them you know way back when at the beginning and, and uh, how is that something that maybe applies to the world today yeah so i've sort of been at, at some at, at at one level i've been giving the similar advice for like 30 plus years <laughs> uh, which is yes. really build security in build privacy in you know, just do, understand we used to call it you know risk modeling or risk assessment. Now people call it threat modeling, but still mm -hmm. just really before you adopt new technology uh, and it's really exciting new technology, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's like, like chat GPT. I was excited about it. You know, I mean, this, I know so many people in security that were excited about it for positive things. I mean, we are also, mm -hmm. there's caution, right. But for really positive things, but you know, we get excited about this technology. We want to adopt it. And there's, here's security. And we're always kind of like running, running behind, like, Hey, wait for me. We got to secure this. <laughs> um, and there's this hope that that you know the next the next thing we're going to be ahead of it we're actually at the table we built security in but um mm -hmm. you know we still i think we got pretty excited about what's going on in generative ai and ml has is being adopted and the most important thing is to step back and understand how it's being used so one first of all just is it resilient and reliable there you know the ways that and as i explained in the course you can have systems fail in either intentionally, i.e. somebody has tried to mess with the system, tried to get it. So it's things like, you know, on purpose, sending it poison data um, or mm -hmm. unintentionally, which is often related to design or not planning things out carefully with a threat modeling mindset. So that's the biggest piece of advice is to ask yourself, what are we using it for? How are we going to use it? If you're building it, have we built it in the most resilient way is it is it has been built ethically is it been built responsibly and if you are acquiring it from another organization do you trust that organization and what have they done to ensure that it's going to be fit for purpose because remember again this is in these, this is narrow ai in the sense one that it's not general it's not thinking for itself but it's also narrow in that we have different use cases different models different types of machine learning are good for different purposes so um, I, 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 which I was once I was on the RSA shop floor, show, shop floor, show floor. Um, and I said, I said it is kind of a factory. Um, I said to, to somebody at a booth, I was asking them about they, they basically were you know, saying our AI is the smartest in the world. You'll never have a security problem again. And I asked them how it worked, and I said, well, is it supervised or unsupervised? I said it's one, it's one model. It's completely unsupervised. It's so smart, it solves all its own problems. And I thought. Okay. Well, you know, yeah. um, it's like I've seen this movie before. Like I've been around for a yeah. while. And I think that, yeah, those are great pieces of advice. Like, you know, nothing has really changed in terms of what you need to have. And that, you know, you know, looking for bias for sure. Uh, cybersecurity is yeah. super important. And there's if you if you try to go first to market, it might 
become a problem that you don't want. So you need to make sure that you address these things early. So since everyone is working on a go-to-market AI strategy right now with specifically ChatGPT, and there's others uh, releasing products and APIs, I feel like we're going to have this massive influx of, of AI into our lives. Like, you know, I, I mentioned this in the intro to the show that you don't know if the call that you get, is that going to be a person? And what happens when, you know, you ask, a, a, you know, a GPT or something to make a call for you. And then the, the thing that's answering the call is also an AI. And, then, <laughs> you know, so we've seen like instances of these horrible things happening when AIs start talking to each other. Uh, and so what what would you say is the top concern for you in terms of cybersecurity with these the, sort of the acceleration of everything happening right now that everybody feels like they got to th throw something out there, you know, regardless of whether or not they're ready for it? Yeah, I, I, do, I love the, the, the yeah, pitting the AIs against each other, yes. you know, like <laughs> even in something simple like uh, I was using one AI scheduling tool and a friend of mine was using a different one and we decided to just let them go at it and see if they could figure out how to schedule. <laughs> Surprisingly, right. they could not. They locked each other up. Um, but Yeah, I remember um, the story of this the one guy who had like tried to automate all his meetings so that he had like a like a video of himself and it would like play just and then uh, I can't remember if he was answering, but you imagine like in a few years, like you don't know if anybody in the meeting is actually a person. Like they could just be all, you know, AIs with, um, you know, duplicating your face. You could be like in, I don't know, Tahiti, uh, zipping some margaritas or something like that. It's got to change how everybody thinks about everything, right? I would say, although, I mean, it'd be interesting to see how well, I mean, I think AIs can be pretty good at, um, you know, we've all seen this, you know, pretty good at, at sort of limited interactions but at some point i think that you know there, there's tells about you know, are you actually talking if you, your colleague is this really your colleague mm -hmm. or are they not um are they not you know being who you think they are i mean i at uh, years and years ago i was uh, in france and a former kpmg colleague was also in france at the time and we had a, fr a colleague back in, in new york and and he was they were iming and mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so my friend said, hey, Diana, you pretend to be me on the I am. And I wrote one sentence. One sentence. And immediately it was, who is this? And I think it might be Diana because I know that you're going to France. And I was like, wow. And I tried so hard not to be caught. So it works <laughs> really when we know people. So it works if I don't know somebody, right? And, and I don't know who you are. And maybe oh, you seem a little bit weird or stilted, but... Um, but if, if we know, if it's your colleague that you work with every day, I'd be interested to see, and it was a meeting, like a one-on-one, -on -one, be interested to see if some, if you could really, um, fool yeah, somebody I mean, very long, it's, but. it's just, it feels like it's just going to get crazy. Like the world yeah. is just going to get nuts because the things that people, uh, were able to do without any of this technology is going to be much easier to do later on. Like we found out through the pandemic that a lot of people had moved in, through the pandemic because they could move to somewhere, you know, where the standard of yeah. living was a lot cheaper. And then when everybody said, you got to come back to the office, we're like, well, my office is like three states, states away now. So I don't know if I can come right. back. So those sort of things. So you did this interview at the RSA conference where you spoke about how some of these AIs could actually be super useful in helping with uh, mitigation. So can you talk a little bit about how maybe companies can implement things in a positive way where AIs actually end up helping humans? Yeah, I, so one of the important things that, that we said a lot when I was at, at IBM, and especially because there was so much work going on with Watson, and you know, I was there when we were initially training Watson for cyber. I think that's called like Watson Assistant for Curator or something at this point, but that's you know where that technology um, landed. And what we were really always very cautious about was that this wasn't about replacing human beings in the SOC. It wasn't about mm -hmm. you know getting rid of humans. It was really about automating those tasks that either humans aren't as good at, i.e. It's pretty hard for humans to see patterns in massive, massive amounts of data. 
but that's something that machines are very good at, just as machines are very good at calculating very long numbers. And when they multiply, mm -hmm. you know, do calculations on long numbers, it's better than most human beings are at it. Uh, so finding patterns and massive amounts of information, which is something that SOC analysts need to do, or to start to predict based on all that information, the probability of an attack being successful or the impact mm -hmm. of that kind of attack. So it's really looking at how to support and help the analysts rather than replace the analysts. And one of the things that with Watts we were looking at was decision support for the analysts. So being able to go through uh, investigations significantly faster than they were able to without the system because it was helping them find information like it could, you know, research a piece of malware, reverse engineer it, you know, find linked IOCs within the ecosystem, you know, all these kinds of things that can take time for humans to do. But, you know, looking at an AI being able to, to help that be better. Um, again, the, the probability and patterns, if you look at that with things like SIMS, you know, we, we, you know, we write tons and tons of rules on our SIMS, but getting those SIMS to be smarter in the sense that by looking at patterns of attack, being able to help us understand where it's likely that we may be attacked, where it's where we're more protected, um, you know, just getting those better insights for the human beings to make better architectural decisions about what to protect and how to protect it. So it's really, you know, it's those pieces of not replacing the humans. Right now, we're not there. It's about mm -hmm. using these systems to improve the efficacy of the humans by doing things like searching data, putting data together more quickly, or um, finding probabilities of patterns. Those are some good points. I think that there is a sense in which maybe you do worry about the escalation, sort of like the Cold War, the computer Cold War of whatever systems you create, somebody is going to uh, create systems to combat those <laughs> systems. And then we have the AIs again, sort of talking to each other, like we mentioned before. One of the things that you've talked about or um, in your courses and in other places is on this role that maybe sustainability has or in AI that, you know, we are burning through so much energy and power in, you know, going through some of these systems. You know, uh, you mentioned, you know, the amount of data that these systems are trained on. I think ChatGPT was 175 billion parameters. That's a crazy number. Uh, you know, if you know how much of a billion is, I mean, that's just nuts. So you've written on this role of sustainability and things like AI and how it relates to cyber attack. So with the acceleration and adoption of these systems happening, how do we make sure we're just not burning through so much power and what should we do in these sort of instances? Yeah, I mean, the power it is. It's funny because we're we've, we've all thought about the crypto mining. We've all seen the giant crypto mining, you know, like farms and you know how much energy is being used by them. But yeah, yeah, AI really does. It takes power too. back in 2020. Um, Wired had a piece about open AI, which they're the, the chat GPT folks, but they've, they've been at it for many years and they had an algorithm back then that was solved, able to solve a Rubik's cube with a robotic mm. hand. And it, in order to do that, they used a thousand desktop computers, a dozen wow. specialized <laughs> devices, devices. It was running for, for months. And the estimate was that the whole project consumed about two point gigawatt hours. Uh, which wow. apparently is one hour of output from multiple two or three nuclear power plants. So, yeah, this is serious. So if you're if you're listening to this and you haven't thought about it, and you're like, well, it's not crypto mining. It, it, too, is really, really energy intensive. So we do need to take a, a look at this. And there's there's a couple of, of and thankfully, there's the, the wonderful thing about being in technology that at least I, I think is just how there's so many smart people doing so many incredible things. And some very smart people have already created a host, a host of project up at GitHub called um, Machine Learning CO2 Impact. And mm. developers can go there and compute the carbon emissions uh, associated with machine learning. So if you want to understand how much your project, how much energy and resource your project may be using, there's actually a, a way to, to do this. So I think that's great. And I think that as, as we continue to use these solutions, we're going to look at ways to you know, reduce the carbon load overall. And I think companies hmm. can institute policies that prioritize the energy use to help reduce the pressure on the environment, look at things like, again, using renewables and can we increase that use to be able to reduce the load overall? Because these are, you know, 
they're they're resource intensive and as and mm. customers consumers you know large companies are buyers of these solutions and those companies have power with their dollars as all consumers have powers with dollars and and we can say we're we're looking for transparency around ethical use of ai and that should include some transparency into what the resource or energy load is mm. and how that's going to impact energy use overall yeah, definitely something that we need to look at. If I have one piece of advice for all the technologists talking about gigawatts, I think you should talk about it in terms of how many time traveling trips you can make in, uh, <laughs> in Back to the Future. Because I think then that use gigawatts, it was like a, a few gigawatts. I think people can relate to it yeah. maybe in a little way. So maybe That's another um, yeah. sort of piece of like uh, scarier news. So last Thursday, uh, the Biden administration released a policy actually attempting to regulate. Uh, sorry, I have the I have the wrong thing. So here, so the, the, actually they attempted to regulate banks, utilities, and hospitals against cyber attacks. This is actually quite an important thing to be thinking about. But there's always like all these pressures between externalities, like attacks from the enemies, as well as you know, kind of the back and forth between the public and the private sector needs. So what do you think is the right strategy for implementation of something like this on a governmental scale? And how does that change this world of where we're seeing that acceleration of mass and adoption in AI? Yeah, and there's there's always a balance, right? Regulation mm -hmm. can over regulation can really limit innovation. On the other hand, innovation unchecked may not be safe and it may have, mm -hmm. you know, uh, repercussions or unintended consequences. So there's there's always a balance and there's no easy answer. You know, I wish it was as simple as, yeah, just write some law and everything will be fine. I mean, that's not it. And in fact, laws written in the wrong way could hamper our innovation. But one of the things in that the March National Cybersecurity Strategy that I really liked was the pillar about rebalance the responsibility to defend cyberspace, because that needed mm -hmm. to get called out. Uh, a lot of the, has really, it's really a lot of the onus has been on us, the end users, you know, the small businesses, the micro businesses, local governments have really been the ones that you guys go figure out cybersecurity. And to rebalance it and, and put the, the responsibility on the big tech companies, I think at least some of that responsibility, you know, I think that makes sense. Again, there's always got to be a balance and this is always going to be a partnership, a shared responsibility model. You can make a very safe car and, you know, you, everything, the brakes are great. You know, the, it, it's got you know, anti-skid, you know, it's got wonderful uh, warning if you're going into the wrong lane, but still the person who's driving that car, it's up to them to drive it responsibly. So I, I, I welcome, and I think that the rebalance is good, but also this is always going to be shared responsibility. Um, I think that, you know, big tech, I kind of hope that they, um, you know, take this as remember it is a strategy. It's not a set of laws. So big tech's still going to have the the question on how they adopt it and how they and what they do with it. Um, Security is not cheap. Ethical, mm. responsible AI isn't cheap. We just said that you know that the the actual the energy isn't cheap. Certainly, data scientists are brilliant, expensive resources. They're not cheap. So putting out AI and ML is not it's not non it's non trivial in terms of cost. Adding security in security tends to increase costs at least a little bit. So the question mm -hmm. is going to be, are we as consumers going to ask our companies that are supplying AI and ML to ensure that they're resilient and inclusive and ethical and secured? Or are mm -hmm. we going to look to the government to say, big tech, we're going to not just have a plan for you to opt into, but we're going to have you know some, some regulatory oversight that's going to require having more um, security and resilience in there. And, and I think, you know, Let's see how this plays out, but it is really important that we do that somehow yeah. it occurs and it'll probably be a little bit shared like we see with cars where it's a little bit some people yeah, find it. it's it's always good to see leadership in in a place like that where it you know whatever somebody comes out with uh, somebody will challenge and we'll work it out, but it's good to see that people yeah. are already thinking about the issues. So just to yeah. uh, comment on, on another thing that happened about uh, a week ago, this website called uh, Biden Cash is a dark web, web uh, card market release information on 2 million valid credit cards 
And it almost seems like I'm I'm getting desensitized to this now. Uh, the, the, these things are becoming commonplace. And so, do you feel that AI is going to is going to help or exacerbate these types of problems in the future? Yeah, the binding cash one was like because they were they were celebrating, right? It had been a year that they were in business or something. And like, look at how many credit cards we have. Um, yeah, which is kind of like because it's like because in security we're all about no stopping the criminals, dropping misuse. So seeing them celebrate was very <sighs> frustrating. But um, yeah, card attacks are absolutely right. I mean, card attacks are, are very they're commonplace. I mean, it's you know it's a number and a, a zip code and you know a cvv and that's it and you know and an expiration date right and you can go shopping uh the plus side i think on card attacks is that the the card companies have really really upped their fraud detection game so mm -hmm. the the sooner that you can understand if that card is being misused and shut that card down the better it is because the you're 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 raising the cost for the attacker because they had to do this work to get the card or pay for the card if they didn't do the work, but they bought it from one of the carding sites. But then if it's not usable, if they can't go shopping with it, then it doesn't have value with them. So the, the better that we can up that fraud, I think the, the more powerful it is about, you know, that's a fantastic way to stop carding. Um, I, for one, one of the fastest things ever for me was I was at a, a restaurant in Vegas. And I tend to when I, I'm on the road because I ha I'm a vegan and I have severe allergies. I'm, I'm a nightmare with the food. So I carry most of my own food mm, and mm. I rarely eat in restaurants that I pay for. You know, sometimes I have to, it's a business dinner or something, but I, I walked out, it was, I had taken a friend to lunch and I walked out, it was a steakhouse and I like, leave, I, we paid, we're leaving the steakhouse and I get a phone call from my bank saying that, Hey, we think that there's fraud. And that was pretty impressive because I travel all yeah. over the world and like that was, it was just that, that was a really, it was a very sensitive detail for it to pick up quickly. And if we can get that, the, the better that that fraud detection gets, the less valuable those cards will become to attackers in the long run. And it got to the point where um, cards for a while were going for just pennies out on mm. the, they had been like pretty high value for a long time, but they were going down and and, and price. Now, some of what the reason people want the carding information is less about the card itself and more about that durable data, because our durable data, the data that we can't change is really interesting to attackers. Credit card, right? You shut it down, you issue a new one, boom. Um, now you have a valueless number. Uh, but mm. your birth date, your your mother's maiden name, which probably they can get on Ancestry.com, but um, you know where you the house you grew up on, a lot of other stuff that may be in our financial records is durable. You can't change your, but you might want to like. I know some people want to fib about their birthday, make themselves older or younger, but the reality <laughs> is your birthday is your birthday, right? That's right. Um, that's so right. they we do want that durable data. Um, where I, I worry about what's going on with AI and carding is trying to get the information using AI, like you know, using it for phishing. So hmm. right now, if you want to have a really targeted fish, usually a human has to do quite a bit of legwork to figure out interesting things. You know, what, what, who are Ray's friends? Where is Ray work? What does Ray like to do? Right. The more I know about that one, lots on, we leave these breadcrumbs on social, um, you know, the, the, that's some actual work to create a very good fish that could potentially fool you. But using these systems now and generative AI, it's quite possible that we can really shortcut that so that makes it cheaper for the attacker to give you a really good fish that might dupe even a person who is who's pretty savvy into thinking oh this is the real this is the real deal which is another reason why i always try and warn people you know ai no ai keep in mind what you've left as breadcrumbs out there for mm -hmm. um the public to see like if you asked me hey how are nick and nora I wouldn't for a second think that that meant anything about that you knew me. I constantly talk about my dog's names are Nick and Nora. So it doesn't mean that you know anything about me. It just means that you, or that you know me personally. It just means that you know, you've seen some things that mm -hmm. I've said. So always remembering that when we get these really detailed fish, which I think that we're gonna get more of these sort of these, I think of them as laser fish, right? Cause we had fishing and then spear fishing. And I think this is like a laser <laughs> fish where it's really very designed for you. I think what we're going to see those the cost of, of creating those go down because of because of mm. ai so just if people be extra careful interesting so another thing that i love about the courses where you talked about 
the different ways that the training data for AIs can be vulnerable to things like noise. This is the scary part of the of the, mm -hmm. of the course, which was great because yeah. then you talk about yeah. things afterwards. But uh, your course does a great job of going all over these. Now, a good example for this very famous example that I think you may have touched on is, of course, Microsoft Tay, the Twitter bot that was made uh, by Microsoft and attack attackers quickly learn how to corrupt that data. Can you talk a little bit about this instance and maybe what we have learned since then? Yeah, I, the, the first thing I'd like to say is a, a huge, I think Microsoft deserves a huge amount of credit for being open about what happened with Tay and talking about it and it being a learning example because there's nobody, mm -hmm. if, if people could just create perfect AI and ML and, and had all the answers, right? If we weren't still in learning mode ourselves, uh, we aren't going to get anywhere. So I love that Microsoft. And when I was at Microsoft, I did often publicly speak about Tay. So Tay was 2016. Microsoft researchers wanted to, you know, learn about an example bot um, and see how it acquired with the training for learning was done through conversations. So where's a great place where conversations are happening? Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, so <laughs> they launched Tay or Tay tweets out on, on Twitter. And the researchers were very clear. There was no attempt to confuse anybody. It was. It said right in the bio that Tay was was an AI bot, and, and it said, unfortunately, the bio said it was very hopeful. It said, the more you talk, the smarter Tay gets, which uh, that was a little bit hopeful. Uh, kind of a and prompt, then, yeah. Yeah. Um, a fun fact. Uh, apparently, Taylor Swift's team was actually reaching out to Microsoft about Tay, <laughs> but that all became moot <laughs> wow. because, yeah, about Tay, yeah, um, which that would have been interesting. But in any case, um, it didn't go quite as, as planned because the learning, right, the teaching, the input to Tay, which again, remember, is a system, is a bot, the input started to get really dark, really fast. Specifically, it was very racist. It was very misogynistic. So Tay, because, right, if you say, Tay, Tay isn't ethical in the sense that Tay isn't going to, you know, these systems don't necessarily, is this good or this bad, right? These are kind of, often these are human decisions about, you know, is this is this right or this wrong, right? Tay is is looking at, at just, if, if you're teaching Tay things like Hitler was right, and I mm. do not, I'm just quoting, um, if, mm -hmm. if Tay keeps hearing that, Tay will respond because that's what Tay has been trained on. So Tay is going to respond saying things like Hitler's, which is in fact what Tay did. It took less than 24 hours for it to get so bad that Microsoft had to take Tay down. So Tay did learn, but this was a great example of when you teach a system with data that is considered inaccurate or offensive, then the system will produce inaccurate or offensive outputs. Yeah, and uh, I think that we learned a lot from that example. Um, and um, perhaps those things are, uh, you know, you could see sort of the beginning of those controls be built into the systems that we need in order to operate, perhaps at the level um, that we're going to be entering with generative AI and ChatGPT and those things. So another troublesome thing that I found today was this article from Ars Technica about thousands of people being scammed by AI voices, uh, mimicking loved ones in emergencies. I, my heart just sort of broke when I saw this article right here from Ars Technica. And basically what was happening here was that, um, you know, since AIs can now duplicate people's voices extremely well. Basically, they in just with a few sentences, uh, people were able to train AIs to make them sound like perhaps somebody's family. And uh, they were asking people for money. So here, one couple sent $15,000 through a Bitcoin terminal to a scammer after believing they had spoken to their son. Uh, the generated AI-generated voices told them that he needed to get legal fees. And so really scary, I mean, heartbreaking you know is there a way to you know prevent this sort of thing or what do we do about instances like this where you know the the technology is getting so good that you have to question releasing some of these things into the world um, before uh you know for people to scammers to go ahead and start implementing these things yeah, and these are, I actually know two people who have had this happen in their family. It very often, it does, it targets 
you know, elder or older people and it's, it's your son or very often a grandchild. I had said earlier, hey, my friend figured out that I was me from one, one I am. Uh, but when, when you get these calls, it's really scary. And this was, you know, so it, it, your adrenaline's going, it, you panic, and the mm -hmm. voice can sound. Afterwards, I've, I've talked to someone who got fooled and said afterwards, so embarrassed and so ashamed that they'd fallen for it. But they were told mm. that their grandchild was at risk. They heard the voice. They thought maybe it was their grandchild, very scared, very, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, these are very real. And a former military friend of mine, um, can't say your name, but former military friend gave me this this tip, and I think everybody should should do it, which is have a duress word for the family, so that mm -hmm. if you are truly in duress, if you have truly been kidnapped, you say that word, and that's how your family will know that it is really you and not mm -hmm. um, an AI bot or some other scam. That's a fantastic point. Um, I you know we always have the pre-show, and I said as soon as I get done, I need to talk to my wife about this because it's such an important yeah. thing. And it's it's such a simple thing to do. There's lots of things that we, as a family, you know, some joke from a TV show that only like the family yeah. understands that they heard, and it's a thing that you say all the time. Uh, there's yeah. ways of coming up with like really simple, uh, you know, you know, instead of letting the AIs do it, there's actually human ways that you can maybe achieve some of these simple ways of protecting yourself. So I really love that yes. tip. And so just an ending and in, in kind of like more positive notes, I think you were mentioned some of these things. And this is one of the things that I love about your course and on security risks and AI and machine learning. You talked about the importance of getting cybersecurity right. You know, in recent times, we heard AIs from Google, for example, that are able to diagnose medical issues. And we saw this fantastic example yeah. about, oops, I'm sorry, it looks like, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, about this AI being able to detect cancer that doctors miss. That's a gift. That's a fantastic thing for an AI yeah. to be able to do. In some ways, uh, the you know AIs can be better than humans in being able to detect some of these things. Um, so, talk about some of the you know, maybe uh, you know things that we that AI has been able to do that is so positive like this, or maybe a hope that you have in the future for good things that can come from AI. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that that's exactly it, is to assist human beings to, you know, take a look at the radiograph, be a second, just like that ideation piece, right? Ideation is, is, is as we're saying, hey, I want to like start to brainstorm. Well, the system can give you some statistically probable responses. It can, it, the rules of grammar are pretty hard. In fact, you know, what's, what's good writing? Um, so they can help with editing, which is absolutely amazing. And then things like classification here and being able to mm -hmm. either better understand the imaging for classification or to look for patterns in, which is a, and this has been going on for a while with healthcare. And, and I, I think it got kind of oversold as a cancer curing moonshot a few years ago, uh, not because it can't help us do it, but because we were a little bit early in the phase. But you look at, if you can take the data of all the cancer patients in the world, even for example, and start finding patterns, we might understand. Here's a pattern we all know. Smoking is more likely to give you lung cancer. But what patterns aren't that obvious that we may be able to find where people live? You know, someone who drinks from plastic water bottles, it may be that these, so I'm, I'm super, for all that, the reason I talk about securing AI and ML so much is that I am so excited about it and what we can do with it and use the systems. We have so much data that these systems can help us to understand and to really help us to be better as long as we use them securely and safely. Yeah, I think that if we can identify the places where computers are superior to humans, they don't get tired, yeah. you know, um, they can, they're so good at yeah. pattern matching uh, and in some ways now generative type of things that I think that we could really get so many benefits from just uh, learning what things they're good at and what things they're, they're not good at. So I think that that's where the real future is super hopeful. I do wanna mention this, one of my favorite examples from your course, uh, and it's about this new Newfoundland dog in 1908 Paris who was trained on rescuing children who had fallen on the river. I don't know if you remember this story. Can you talk a little bit oh, yeah. about that story and how it relates to AI? Yeah, so it's about reinforcement learning and 
what had happened was fell into the river and this dog jumped into the river to save the child just very naturally and 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 got out and and everybody was like oh my god this dog is amazing so they gave it a steak and they told it, it was a wonderful dog dogs if you don't have a dog dogs love to be cooed at you know so they're cooing at the mm-hmm. dog and they're saying it's an absolutely wonderful dog and then a kid fell in the next day and it's like wow children are falling into the sand apparently so you know again the dog was like oh we love you and then eventually it came out that the dog had because it really really enjoyed being treated and loved and getting beefsteak it had started to push children into the river so that it could go and, and save them and with reinforcement learning that has been found in systems where um, if you reinforce the reward that the system may not you know make the same sort of decisions about is this good or bad right so the dog pushing the child in wasn't necessarily bad because the dog was going to save it so in reinforcement learning with things like a a a vacuum robot is an example Mm -hmm. if it's it's supposed to clean up spills and the vacuum robot because cleaning up the spill is the reward uh the vacuum robot started to actually knock things over so that it mm-hmm. would have the reward of being able to clean it up, which is obviously not the the outcome that that people want. So it's just being cautious. Again, there's a lot of moving parts in, in these systems as we as we train them, and so just making sure. And that's what threat modeling is about: is taking a look at those different um, those different aspects. Yeah, and that's like I mentioned, the thing that I really loved about your course that you have so many great stories of you know examples of things that had happened, and I just love this one because I have a I have a dog as well. Name is Mojo. Uh, I call him the coding dog, and I was wondering about that dog bed in the background, uh, in your background over over there somewhere. Oh, that's the so and, the, the dogs are in another room. That's actually the cat bed. So the oh, know, two oh, dogs oh. and two cats. Yeah. Well, there you go. So uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can really relate to like training the dogs, and and you can tr- training sometimes to do the wrong thing um, by reinforcing thing and. That's exactly, in a way, how we train some of these AI systems and computers. So we have to watch out for those things as well. So awesome. Um, I think that we have, let's see, what are we doing on time? We're kind of a little bit over, and I think I answered most of the questions. So thank you so much for coming. I really had a lot of fun. Um, AI isn't something that, I mean, uh, AI is something that I'm thinking about a lot, but cybersecurity wasn't something that I was thinking about until I really watched your course and so enjoyable. If you're not a cybersecurity person, I think that you should still go check it out. You know, Diane is really engaging and she's just as fun on the course as well. So don't uh, remember to sort of like and subscribe um, on, uh, you can go to the page for this series at go.rabo.org slash TFIT and uh, hit the notification icon there. And you can also, of course, look for our own pages. Um, You know, I have a bunch of courses on LinkedIn and Diana, uh, you have one right now, but hopefully we'll get some more from you as well in the future. So next time I have this amazing guest, Uh, his name is Shavi Amatrain. He is the VP of AI at LinkedIn, the company that I work for, that I work for. (laughs) So I'm super excited. Uh, He is a new hire. He actually came from the health industry. And uh, I'm super excited to be able to talk to him um, about, you know, what his role is uh, as the VP of AI at LinkedIn and where he sees how all this stuff is going to affect platforms like ours. So very, very exciting. Thank you so much, Diana. I really, really enjoy talking to you. And uh, we'll we'll talk to you you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.